So let's go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 8 tonight. The book of Luke. I preached a message about, I don't know, maybe a year or so ago and started with this same passage of scripture. Sometimes the Lord just keeps things on your heart. So we're going to go to verse 22, and we'll read 22 through 25. And it says, Now it came to pass on a certain day that he went into a ship with his disciples, and he said unto them, Red letters, this is the word of God. Let us go over to the other side of the lake. And they launched forth. But as they sailed, he fell asleep. And there came down a storm of wind on the lake, and they were filled with water, and they were in jeopardy. Other translations say they were in great danger. This is no joke, right? All right. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. In fact, again, other translations say, Don't you care that we are perishing? <laughs> Crazy, right? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. And he said unto them, Where is your faith? And they, being afraid, wondered, saying to one another, What manner of man is this? For he commands even the winds and the water to obey him. The Amplified for verse 25 says, And he said to them, Why are you so fearful? Where is your faith, your trust, your confidence in me, in my veracity, in my integrity? Where is it? Where is your trust in me? Because he said, red letters earlier, let us go over to the other side. He'd already said that's what was going to happen. That's the word of God to them, right? Any of you guys ever received a word of God to you? You read it in the Bible, you saw it, you were like, yes, I'm going to do that. And then life and symptoms and circumstances <laughs> and storms, right? And you're like, did it did he really say that? I'm not really sure. Did it mean that? Like, <laughs> you start to question it, right? And then you get the question, where is your faith? Why are you so fearful? Where's your trust in me? Where's your confidence in me, right? We've all done that. And this is the question that we should all be asking ourselves every day as attacks come against us. Every attack. And it is the question that is the title of my sermon tonight. Where is your faith? Sometimes when we listen to that, I think that, at least me, I take that as almost like a, a chastisement of a question, you know, where's your faith? What are you doing? Right? But I want you to think of it differently. I want you to think of it as an actual, genuine question. Where is your faith? Because, you know, when we go back to verse, is it 24? Um, no, 25. He asks them the question, where's your faith? And then it goes on immediately to say that they, being afraid, wondered, saying to one another, what manner of man is this? So what should they have been thinking about? Where's their faith, right? He just asked them a really important question, and immediately they start questioning what manner of a man he is, and they're not thinking about the question that he asked them. It's a really important question that we know where our faith is. You know, if you get a symptom in your body, where's your faith? You have an unexpected bill that comes in, where's your faith? We have to ask ourselves that question, where is my faith in this moment? Where is it? What do I believe right now? Right? If uh, we're dealing with symptoms of depression and loneliness or sadness or anxiety, where is our faith? Where does it sit? And um, Jesus sometimes said that they were a faithless generation. He used that term. But when I was praying about this message, the Lord actually said to me that there's, nothing, there's no such thing as losing your faith or lost faith. It's really a transfer of faith. You're transferring your faith from one thing to another. When God says he wants you to have faith, it means he wants you to have faith in him and what he says. It doesn't mean that 
he just wants you to have faith in anything, right? But you can have faith in whatever you choose to have faith in. Um, faith is simply what you believe. And it's important that we locate what we believe. That's super important. You do not want to go into storms and trials of life without knowing what you actually believe. People have gotten themselves into real trouble doing that, right? Choosing to not go to the doctor when they very much should have gone to the doctor because their faith was not there. You know, choosing not to get help when they should have gotten help because their faith wasn't there. We have to know where our faith is at. This life is a, there's no do-overs, you know? <laughs> we only get to do this one time. So we wanna take these things really seriously. Um, and it's, uh, I recently got done reading the book of Judges, and it reminded me that we cannot trust what seems right to us. It, the book of Judges actually ends with, in those days there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own sight. The end of the book of Judges was really hard for me to read because some really bad stuff happened because it was what was right in their sight right and there is a king for us right we have jesus we have a solid king to look to always that always makes the right decision that always gives the right direction that always helps us with exactly what we need we have a king right and we have to rely on him and we can't do what's right in our sight when we do that we are going to mess everything up all of us <laughs> because what's right in our sight is mixed with all kinds of other things the influence of the of the world the influences of our family and friends and all kinds of things the emotions that we have we have to make sure that we have a solid foundation we have to make sure that our faith is in the Word of God and the Word of God only it has to be here this is the only foundation that we can build our life on that is going to keep us steady at all times. So let's go to Matthew chapter 7. You guys doing okay out there? Good. All right. And we're going to start in verse 24. And I'm going to read it out of the Passion Translation. Miss Carla and Pastor John have recently talked a lot, and I've in the past recently talked about, or in the past have talked about um, sticking with, you know, your foundational translations of the Bible, like the King James Version. Um, and that, you know, the other translations are really just um, to help us understand things, but we can't put, you know, everything in that. So I wanted to kind of explain why that I'm using it because I, I looked at the King James Version, and then I looked at the other one, and, and the, the Passion Translation just really is, it says exactly what it needs to say, but in a really beautiful way that helps us in our modern language. So um, you can't trust everything that every modern translation says. I think the Passion Translation is one of the better ones, um, but still, just as Pastor John and Miss Carla have been teaching, you gotta have your standard Bible um, that you're really getting your foundation out of when it comes to the translation of your Bible. But I do want to read this in the Passion Translation. It says, Everyone who hears my teaching and applies it to his life can be compared to a wise man who built his house on an unshakable foundation. When the rains fell and the floods came, and with fierce winds beating upon his house, it stood firm because of its strong foundation. But everyone who hears my teaching and does not apply it to his life can be compared to a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And when it rained and rained and the flood came, the wind, with wind and waves beating upon his house, it collapsed and was swept away. The King James Version says, whoever hears my, my sayings and does them. But I really love how the Passion Translation says, everyone who hears my teaching and applies it to his life. That's what I loved about this version because that is exactly what I believe God is trying to say in this scripture. Applies it to his life. This is how we know what we believe, is when we apply it to our lives. That's how we know. And just like King David, he killed a lion, he killed a bear, then he killed Goliath. We can't just apply it to our lives when a huge storm hits and think that we're going to have the foundation that we need. 
we need to start applying it to our lives today when the little things come up, right? That's so important so that you truly know where your foundation is and you truly know what you believe in life. The unshakable foundation, the rock that holds us no matter the storm, is the word of God applied to our lives. That is our unshakable foundation. Everything has to come back to the word of God. Everything. We have to be really cautious not to just hear the word of God, mentally agree to it, and then just move on. Anybody been there? We've all been there, right? All of us have done that. But we have to be super cautious not to do that. That's where in James 1.22, it says we deceive ourselves, merely listening to the word, but not doing anything with it, right? We're supposed to be doers of the word of God. We're supposed to apply it to our lives. Because when we hear it, and we don't do anything with it, we think we know it. So the next time we hear it, we're like, oh yeah, I know that, I got that. But it's not working in our lives. It's not doing anything in our lives, so we really don't have it. But we've deceived ourselves. We've fooled ourselves into thinking that we, we know that, we got that. If we did know it, we would get excited every time we heard it, right? We wouldn't be like, yeah, I got that, I'm good. Because <laughs> I don't know about you, but I get really excited about what's working in my life, right? It's, it's super exciting. Um, we need to know, or we know that we need to hear the teachings of Jesus, or as Romans 10, 17 puts it, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But if we back up one scripture to Romans 10, 16, it says, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? And again, popping into the Passion Translation, if we put those together, it says, but not everyone welcomes the good news. Good news is the word of God, right? We can just, it, it, it'll help us to flip that. But not everyone welcomes the word of God, as Isaiah said. Lord, is there anyone who hears and believes our message? Faith, then, is birthed in a heart that responds to God's anointed utterance of the Anointed One. Faith belongs to those who hear and respond to the Anointed Word of God. Praise God, right? That's who faith belongs to, faith in God, the faith that moves mountains. It belongs to those who hear and respond to the Anointed Word of God. And, you know, this is quoting Isaiah, but we can actually go all the way back to Isaiah. This comes from Isaiah 53.1, where Isaiah actually says, Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? In the Amplified, it says, Who has believed, confidently trusted in, relied on, and adhered to our message of salvation? And to whom, if not us, has the arm and infinite power of the Lord been revealed? Praise God, right? Praise God that that is exactly, that's, it, it's making sure that we're believing God's report, right? Anybody remember the song, Whose Report Will You Believe? Y'all want me to sing it for you? I'll sing it for you. Whose report will you believe? We shall believe the report of the Lord. Tell me whose report will you believe? We shall believe the report of the Lord. His report says I am healed. His report says I am filled. His report says I am free. His report says victory. That's what his report says, right? Praise God. We have to make sure that everything comes back to the report that God gave us, to his report, right? So the second question is, whose report will you believe? Which, for the record, is the exact same question said differently. Where's your faith? <laughs> right? <laughs> Whose report will you believe? Amen. Faith in God, or let me back up just a little bit. Faith is what you believe. It's that simple. Where your faith is, is what you believe. And believing is a choice. Faith is a choice. Every day, every time a symptom comes against your body, every time a 
um, a, a symptom of depression comes against you, every time something tries to break your spirit, make you sad, make you depressed, make you upset, every time that there is a financial something that happens, every attack of the enemy, we have a choice in what to believe. It's not just something that just happens, right? Faith is a choice. What you believe is a choice, which is why every time those attacks happen, we have to ask ourselves, whose report will you believe? Are you going to believe what God said? Are you going to believe what this worldly report says, this natural report, these emotions, these feelings, this stuff that's coming from the natural world? What are we going to believe? It's so important. We have to understand that it's a choice. We get to choose what we believe. But if you don't know what God said, the choice is already made for you. You have to know that. It's so important that we know that. Kenneth Hagin actually used to say that all sickness is spiritual and all healing is spiritual. Everything that we receive from God, we have to receive from the word of God into our spirit. If you try to receive healing with your body, you will fail every time because healing is received in your spirit. It's received through the word of God. He sent his word to heal you, right? Everything that you need is in here. It's, it's just the most amazing, amazing composition of books that has ever been created. And Hebrews 11.1 1 says that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of not, things not seen. And in the Amplified, that says, faith is perceiving as real fact what is not yet revealed to the senses, what you can't yet feel and see and sense. You can't smell it yet, but you know it's there because you receive it by faith. You receive it in your spirit. Everything, all sickness is spiritual. All poverty is spiritual. All depression is spiritual. It's all spiritual. And all healing and provision and help from God is spiritual. You receive it by faith. And then it comes in the natural. But you have to receive it by faith first. And faith is a choice. Faith is choosing to believe God's word despite what your circumstances and your feelings are telling you. How do we get there though? I don't know about you, but I have sat in this room I have heard anointed sermons. I have seen the word of God come to life and jump off of the page and into my heart. And it just seems like nothing is impossible. And then I leave these walls <laughs> and I go back to my circumstances and the things that are happening in my life. And all of a sudden, it can seem much more confusing than that. Even though here, in this anointing, it's not confusing. God is very clear, it is very simple. But out there, our circumstances are screaming at us, trying to distract us, trying to get us away from what God said, away from the word of God, right? So how do we get there? How do we get to that point that when attack comes against us, we respond according to the word of God. We respond in faith and we say, no. We resist that. How do we get to that point? Gloria Copeland says, you only change how you believe by the word of God. It's the only way. You only change how you believe by the word of God. To believe the word of God, you have to know what it says for yourself. You cannot just hear a preacher say something. You have to genuinely read the word of God for yourself. And I get it. I know Every person in this room that immediately says, Miss Sarah, I'm not a re sorry, they call me Miss Sarah in Children's Church. <laughs> Sarah, <laughs> Sarah, I am not a reader. I don't like to read. When I read the Bible, I fall asleep. I don't like to do it. I don't understand it. I get confused. I get you. I was that person. I know that person that you think you are right now. And I'm telling you, that's not who you really are. That's who the devil is telling you that you are. That's who the enemy is telling you who you are. Who you really are is someone who loves to read the Bible because it is a relationship of you talking to God and God talking to you. It is beautiful. And you have to get that straight. Your wife cannot read the Bible for you. 
Your husband cannot read the Bible for you. Your grandma cannot read the Bible for you. Your dog cannot read the Bible. Okay, your dog obviously cannot read the Bible, but <laughs> you have to read the Bible for yourself every single day. You have to reconcile that. You know, I know it's February and you know, most people have already broken all their New Year's resolutions and all that good stuff, but <laughs> there is still time to set goals for the new year. Yes. And if you have to set one goal that actually matters and that will actually see you through the rest of this year, you gotta get into this thing. You gotta get in it. You gotta consume it, right? You know, a lot of people set goals for eating right when it comes to New Year's resolutions. And, um, you know, one of the biggest enemies to eating right, maybe you wanna, you know, eat more fruits and vegetables or lean meats or whatever it is. And, um, but you get really busy that day and you forget to eat breakfast and then, you know, work's really busy. So you just have a cup of coffee for lunch. You know, you just don't have time to eat. What's gonna happen about like three o'clock in the afternoon? You're gonna crash and that bag of Doritos in the vending machine at your work's break room is gonna start looking really good. And now all of a sudden, all of your willpower has gone out the window because you didn't prepare yourself, right? You didn't make sure that you were eating the right things. Same thing is true with the Word of God. This is food for us, right? This is our food and we're supposed to consume it like we consume food. If you don't consume the Word of God every day, you will be led by the enemy into consuming all kinds of stuff and you'll think that there's no choice. You'll think you're just exhausted and you're tired and you just, you just can't focus on anything else. You just have to just watch this ridiculous movie, you know, just because it, it'll calm you down or whatever. You just have to let the world in. That's, that's, how you're gonna, that's how you're gonna relax and zone out, right? And it's all stemming from the root cause of not being in the Word of God. This is the most important thing. We have to be in the Word of God. It's the exact same thing. So, so important. Um, that we get in there. And I'll tell you a trick that worked for me, because as I mentioned, this is somebody that I used to be, so I understand you, I get it, if that is you. And the answer, interestingly enough, was not to read the Word of God less, it was to read the Word of God more. <laughs> I found a, a minister that said that when he was first starting out, he asked God, how much should I read the Word of God? And God told him to read one chapter out of the Old Testament every day, one chapter in Psalms or Proverbs, and two chapters out of the New Testament, and that was his formula for reading the Bible success. And it was the beginning of the formula for my success as well in reading the Bible. Because I found when I didn't just read like one chapter out of the Bible or one small set of scriptures or something like that, that all of a sudden, because I was reading it more, I could see it come to life in a whole different way. You know, I, and I don't read the Bible exactly that way anymore. I read the Bible a lot more than that now simply because I'm engrossed in, in the story, in the beauty, in the, the whole tapestry of it all. Sometimes when I'm reading my Old Testament chapters and my chapters in Psalms or Proverbs and then my chapters in the New Testament, it's amazing how it all is talking about the same thing. And I'm like, that's so cool. <laughs> like, God, how did you know I was going to be at this point and this and this and this and how it was all going to come together? And, and other times, you know, you might be reading the genealogies and that might be your chapter in the Old Testament. And, you know, praise God, you got a chapter in the New Testament with something maybe a little bit more exciting for those of us that aren't into all the names. Although it's fun to pronounce them for about five or six. <laughs> So we have to make sure that we are in the Word of God because everything that we believe has to come back to the Word of God. We have to be looking at it for ourselves. We have to put our eyes on it. And I know you're like, but there are some people who don't have eyes um, and they have grace for that. But you have eyes, so you have to look at the Word of God. <laughs> And when you read your Bible, it's really important that you read it with the knowledge and the understanding that he wrote it for your benefit, not for his. If we read the Bible thinking that he wrote it for his benefit so we would follow all of his rules, then we have some misunderstanding and thinking that God is not all sufficient and complete within himself, that somehow he needs us to follow all of his rules. And that is not true. He is all sufficient. He needs nothing to complete him. He wants us. He desires us. But he is complete and perfect as he is. He does not need us. 
He wanted a family, which is why we are here. So we want to learn about him, learn about who he is. And when we read it, it's amazing how it just opens up to us. But he wrote the Bible for our sakes, so that we could know how to live free, so that we could see the results of living in sin. It's, it's in there, and it's, it's ugly, the results of it. It's, it's all throughout it, right? But we can also see the results of living a righteous life. We can see the results of following God. We can see what it looks like to put the Word of God in our life, because He put it all in the Word for us. It's such a beautiful thing. Let's go to Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. And it says, This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you will meditate therein day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. In the message translation, it says, And don't for a minute let this book of the revelation be out of your mind. Ponder and meditate on it day and night, making sure you practice everything written in it. Then you'll get where you're going, and then you'll succeed. Praise God. And I know pastors talked about it before. People sometimes say things like, well, but how do I think about the Word of God all the time? How do I meditate on that all the time? Like, nobody could really do that, right? But don't worry. God has a plan for that, too. So let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 6. He tells us. Let's go back just a little bit. He tells us exactly. Because God is very clear. He is not confusing. He tells us exactly what we need to know. If we'll just look, we seek and we will find. And in verse 6, it says, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. So, he tells you exactly how to keep the word of God in your mouth and on your mind at all times. You're supposed to teach it to your kids. And if you're sitting around your house, you're supposed to be talking about it. And when you're walking around, you're supposed to be talking about it. And when you lie down, you're supposed to be talking about it. And when you get up, you're supposed to be talking about it. <laughs> he makes it pretty clear, right? He tells us exactly how to do this. The Word of God should be our great focus in life. And in the message translation of that same scripture, it says, Write these commandments that I have given you today on your hearts. Get them inside of you, and then get them inside of your children. Please get them inside of your children. <laughs> Talk about them whenever you, wherever you are, sitting at home, walking in the street. Talk about them from the time you get up in the morning to when you fall in bed at night. Tie them on your hands and on your foreheads as reminders. Inscribe them on the doorposts of your home and on your city gates. Praise God. The Word of God should be everywhere that we look, right? Everywhere we go, the Word of God. In Psalm 19:14, it says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. The Word of God is going to produce in your life just as far as you dare to actually commit to it. Just as far as you dare to commit to it and believe it and put your faith and trust in it. That's how far it will produce in your life. I want to talk for a moment, uh, we're getting close to the end, um, about meditation. And going back to talking about things that Kenneth Hagin used to say, um, probably still does, probably up in heaven still saying these things. He used to say that meditation was the most important part of the faith formula, but also the part that most people skipped. <laughs> it is the most important part of the faith formula, meditation. And um, Joshua, when we read that scripture in Joshua 1.8, it says, meditate therein that you may observe to do. Meditation is when we think about how what we read in the Bible applies to our life, how it changes, how it should change our habits and our thoughts and what we do. It's when we ponder it and just roll over it, right? 
I know we, we've probably all heard that if you know how to worry, you already know how to meditate, right? <laughs> That's just on the opposite side of things. Um, and we have a lot of help to worry, right? <laughs> so but when it comes to meditating on God's word, you might have to put in a little bit more effort because the enemy is not going to help you with that. <laughs> and, uh, and, and God certainly wants you to seek him. He wants you to put the effort in as well. So you have to put the effort in. But when you meditate on the word of God, you can see yourself doing it. You can see yourself having it. You can see yourself being that person that God says you are, who God says you are, having what God says you have, and doing the things that God says that you can do. Meditating on the Word of God is the most important part of the faith formula, but it's also the part that most of us skip. When we meditate on the Word of God, then when that challenge comes to us, that attack comes against us, then our words, are not going to be things like, well, okay, what did the Bible say again about healing? I can't remember. Okay, I'm healed. I know that. I'm healed, top of my head, soles of my feet. People say things like that, right? It's going to come automatically because you've already gotten it in your heart. You're going to be like, no, I resist this symptom in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I am healed. Bible says, by the stripes of Jesus Christ, I was healed. The Bible says that he is the Lord that heals me, the Lord that fixes me, right? So the Word of God, when you meditate on it, it will spill out of your heart. Out of the abundance of your heart, the mouth leaketh, some people say. <laughs> it will spill out when we get it in. But we have to make sure that we spend the time doing that. Can't spend all of our time doing all the talking. Um, we have to make sure that we are just spending some time just pondering and thinking about how does this apply to my life? How does this change my life? And that's such a beautiful thing and it's such an important thing to, thing to do. How do we get God's word as a manifested reality in our lives? I don't know about you, but I really want that. I want all the good things that are in here to be manifested in my life, praise God. We have to make our thoughts, our actions, and our words be in agreement with what God says. Because you are who God says that you are. And you have what God says you have, and you can do what God says that you can do. And we have to realize that God's word does not change, and God does not change. If we want to see more of God in our lives, guess who has to change? We do. We're the ones who have to change. We're the ones who have to put different habits into our life, different practices into our life. I recently um, was led of the Lord to just completely and utterly fast all, like basically internet, TV, all the things. So whether it be news, social media, searching the internet, shopping, that was a little hard for a minute, but I did it. Um, all the things, no TV, no any of it. It's amazing how much time you have to spend with God when you're not doing all of the other stuff, right? <laughs> It was a beautiful thing, and I loved it. I loved getting to come home and be like, okay, Lord, what are we going to do? Am I going to read this book, or am I going to read the Bible, or am I going to pray? Or, you know, it wasn't just, you know how sometimes the Internet will just take away your night, and you didn't even know that it happened, right? And it really gave me a perspective and a balance to thinking about how I'm spending my time and what I'm doing with my time and those things are so important so important so again what is faith faith is believing what God says in his word regardless of what we see with our eyes or hear with our ears or feel with our senses faith believes God's word no matter what our circumstances say and our faith has to be in the word of God and the word of God alone. As they say, anything else is sinking sand. And our foundation will not be strong. Our foundation will not be where it needs to be if our faith is in anything else, even if it's the words of a preacher. Any of you guys ever heard a preacher say something, Pastor John or someone else, and then you went to try to tell it to someone else, and it just became a whole lot of, well then, but then pastor said, blah, 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 blah. And, and they would ask you questions and you're like, well, I don't know. But pastor said, <laughs> because you don't have it as a foundation in your life, right? Um, you have to make sure that, we have to make sure that everything comes back to the word of God. 
when pastor says something, that's great and that's awesome and that's wonderful, but we bring it back to the Word of God because God has to show us exactly how that applies to our life and what that looks like for us. And everybody's life is a little bit different, so he's going to show us how that applies and exactly what to do with it in our lives. So we have to make sure that we fix our foundation. We ask ourselves, where's our faith? Whose report will we are we going to believe the next time something comes up? Are you going to believe a doctor's report? What if it's a good doctor's report? Shouldn't believe that either. <laughs> Everything has to be on the Word of God. Good reports, bad reports, they come from this world. They mean nothing. Our foundation is the Word of God. Everything has to come back to this Word. When we get a good doctor's report, it just needs to be like, Exactly, because the Word of God says, right? I'm glad that your reports have finally lined up with what God said. <laughs> we have to make sure that we don't allow a good doctor's report to be our confirmation that our healing is real. That's a lie. And the next time sickness comes against you, the enemy will use that against you. It's a lie. Your healing is real because God said so. Because it's in this book. Your freedom is real because God said so right? Praise God. 